In this video we're going to talk about ectopic pregnancy and ectopic pregnancy is um, um, best explained with the diagram. Uh, normally um, when you have a fertilized egg um, or a zygote it implants into the uterus and in particular the, the endometrial lining of the uterine cavity and uh, this is the uterine cavity in, inside so the ovary will release a, an egg here and the sperm um, will travel down the fallopian tube and where they meet that's when fertilization occurs and then eventually the egg will travel back down uh, the fallopian tube and eventually implant into the uterus now that happens most of the time but sometimes it does not happen as the fertilized egg implants itself in an ectopic location meaning a location other than normal and there are several locations uh, but the most common of which is shown here being the fallopian tube there's other locations like cervix or abdominal or pelvic cavity but by far the most common is the fallopian tube so why is this a problem? Why is this scenario a problem? The reason is because the fallopian tube doesn't expand the way a uterus uh, does during pregnancy. So eventually the fallopian tube is not big enough to house the growing um, zygote as it becomes an embryo. So between six to, hmm, 6 to 16 weeks there will be a rupture. And then when that happens that's basically the end of the uh, um, pregnancy. Um, so this is a very severe problem and we'll talk about the symptoms and the treatment. First what I wanted to discuss is why does this happen? Um, what would be some of the reasons? Well there's a big long list but I'll touch on the most important reasons. Here's some of the risk factors. Advanced age a prior ectopic pregnancy. Um, another reason that this can happen is a history of pelvic inflammatory disease. And the reason that is is because when you have pelvic inflammatory disease that can result in scar tissue being formed in, in the fallopian tube. And when the scar tissue forms it prevents the um, um, fertilized egg from traveling uh, down uh, to the normal or correct location. So that, that's why pelvic inflammatory disease can be a risk factor. Uh, the use of an intrauterine device for contraception. Um, multiple uh, sexual partners. And um, another important uh, risk factor is cigarette smoking, interestingly. And Another one is prior induced abortion. Uh, emphasis on the word induced. So not a spontaneous, but induced abortion. So those are some of the, the, the reasons. So let's talk about the symptoms. Well, most of the time when the... Uh, when a, when a woman has a ectopic pregnancy there are no symptoms until the um, the rupture occurs and the symptoms vary but if there is a rupture the symptoms will include pelvic pain um, they can include uh, cervical motion tenderness CMT adnexal tenderness Uh, cervical motion tenderness is when the finger is moved uh, when the cervix is moved with the finger on on a physical exam there's tenderness and adnexal tenderness just means tenderness in the, in the adnexa area of the pelvis these symptoms are the symptoms of pelvic inflammatory disease so how do you know uh, if a patient uh, presents or even on a licensing exam if you have these things mentioned in the vignette how do you know that it's pelvic inflammatory disease or ectopic pregnancy? Well, one of the key things that um, you need to uh, look for is in ectopic pregnancy, 
you should suspect uh, an ectopic pregnancy in any female of reproductive age who has these symptoms but also has vaginal bleeding. And another important thing is if she has um, does not know when her last menstrual period was. So those are the, the key things to differentiate pelvic inflammatory disease with um, ectopic pregnancy. So let's say you do have a, a young or any aged uh, female that is still of reproductive age with those symptoms. How would you go about diagnosing it? Well, there's two main things. The first is a urine pregnancy test, which is known as a beta HCG. And the second test is a pelvic ultrasound. And these two tests are the ones that you would do when you suspect an ectopic pregnancy. Um, this one uh, initially is done with urine, and then if it's positive, they sometimes will repeat the test with the patient's blood. Uh, this one, of course, will tell you, will show you um, what is going on. So if it is indeed an ectopic pregnancy, there will be nothing in the uterine cavity. Uterine cavity. But it will show uh, a mass, most likely in the adnexa area, which is here, as it shows in this diagram. So that's what the ultrasound will show. So, how do you treat an ectopic pregnancy? Is there a treatment? Well, there is. There's two main ways. There's surgery, and in particular, we're talking about the resection of the fallopian tube. And that has a special name. It's salpingectomy. Salpingectomy. And what that just means is just a resection of the fallopian tube. You just cut out that portion, assuming the ectopic pregnancy is there. The second thing is with the medication known as methotrexate. Now, methotrexate um, is only used in certain specific uh, conditions. And I'll, I'll explain it. When, when, it, when can you use methotrexate? Methotrexate is usually only used when you have a unruptured tubal pregnancy and in particular it's it's got to be pretty small less than three centimeters and also the beta HCG value needs to be less than 5,000 and if these criteria are met then you can go ahead and use methotrexate but there's a very important part of this um, treatment and that is the follow-up. How do you know that once you give the medication that it's actually working? The way you do that is very specific. After you give the drug, on day four and on day seven, you have to measure the beta HCG level. And what you're looking for is a decrease of greater than 15%. So I should have wrote greater. So let me write, just write it out to avoid confusion. Decrease of 15% or more. And if that is indeed um, the case, when you measure the beta HCG level on days 4 and 7, then you know that methotrexate is working. If it's not, then you have to give a second dose of methotrexate or you have to proceed to surgery. So now I will discuss a couple clinical vignettes here. An 18-year-old girl comes to the emergency department with her mother because of a 12-hour history of lower abdominal pain and nausea. She is sexually active with three different partners and she usually uses condoms for contraception. She's unsure of the exact date of her last menstrual period. She has never had a sexually transmitted disease in the past. Temperature is 101, blood pressure is 110, over 70, pulse is 65. Physical exam shows 
bilateral lower abdominal tenderness, but rebound tenderness and guarding are absent. Pelvic exam shows mild cervical motion tenderness and adnexal tenderness. Small amount of cervical discharge is present. There are no palpable masses. Cervical cultures are taken and sent to pathology for evaluation. The most appropriate next step is the symptoms are very, very uh, similar, or almost identical to pelvic inflammatory disease, PID. But there's one sentence in here that leads you to think of ectopic pregnancy, and that one sentence is right here. She is unsure of her last menstrual period. Now, she may very well have pelvic inflammatory disease, but that one sentence makes you think of ectopic pregnancy. So, when an ectopic pregnancy is suspected, um, the very first thing you need to do is a urine beta HCG. And that would be choice C. All right, next one. 29-year-old female comes to the emergency department where you're working. She is complaining of a two-day history of nausea and vomiting and some mild left lower quadrant <coughs> pain. Vital signs are stable. Physical exam shows mild tenderness to palpation in the left lower quadrant. Prior to performing the pelvic exam, the patient informs you that she is menstruating. Exam is significant only for blood in the vault. Routine lab studies are sent and a beta HCG returns as 2700. You order a pelvic ultrasound and which identifies nothing in the uterus. However, there is a fetal pole in the left fallopian tube. You inform the patient that she has an ectopic pregnancy and discuss the option of surgery versus methotrexate. The patient decides that she would like to try methotrexate. Appropriate follow-up care for this patient will include. Okay, you may remember earlier I talked about methotrexate and that there's certain conditions that you can give it in and one of them is that the beta HCG has to be less than 5,000 and that is indeed the case here. So if you give methotrexate there's a very specific way uh, to follow up and that is on day four and day seven you have to measure the uh, the beta HCG level and if the beta ECG level drops by greater than 15%, um, then you know that um, the treatment is working. So, which one of those would that be? Uh, right here. Repeating beta ECG two weeks after diagnosis, if beta ECG is found to have fallen greater than 15%, from day four to day seven of treatment. 